If you have your Bibles, go ahead and open up to the book of Philippians, please. we dealt with verse 1 of the book of Philippians. Um, I actually realized this week that we really never got an outline. I never gave you guys an outline of Paul's letter to the Philippians. So I'm going to take a step back and give you guys kind of a, a, an overview of what Paul's letter to the Philippians is all about. Now, we call this the letter to the church of Philippi or the, the letter to the Philippians, but really this is a letter to uh, every believer, every one of us. Paul, when he took up his, his stylus, or actually when he spoke to his uh, transcriber, his amanuensis, uh, I think in his mind he was thinking about talking with the the Philippians, the Church of Philippi, and, and that was uh, what motivated him to write, he being inspired by the Holy Spirit. But God can take what we think of as our simple effort and make it into something grand that would honor and glorify him. And so uh, I want to just kind of give you a little bit of an overview of what I think Philippians is all about. So if, if you have your Bible open to the book of Philippians, flip over to chapter 2. If you would, please. Now, we talked about, uh, several weeks ago, we talked about Paul's purpose in writing this letter. Um, we know that he was in prison. Uh, the, the internal evidence indicates that he was in prison. Uh, we know that Paul was in prison several times. Um, we, we see from the, the focus of this letter at the very outset, and then again at the very end, Paul is writing the church to give thanks for their sharing in his ministry. They, they sent Epaphroditus with their gift to go minister to Paul. And so he's, the purpose that he is writing this is to give thanks to them. And unlike a lot of other of Paul's epistles, he doesn't really have a core uh, focus. He's not dealing with doctrine like he does in the book of Romans or church issues like he does in the books of Corinthians. Um, he, he's got a little bit of a different take on this letter. I apologize for whatever reason. Today my mouth is really dry. Um, I believe that the heart of this letter um, is actually in chapter 2. And I think it's, an, if, you, if you really want to memorize a passage of scripture, this is a good, good passage to memorize. Because this is the gospel all lumped up in just a few verses. Okay, so I'm going to start off in verse 1. But I, I think the, the focus uh, really picks up about verse 3 or 4 and then goes down through verse 11. So Paul is addressing them. He says, So if there is any encouragement in Christ, any comfort from love, any participation in the Spirit, any affection and sympathy, complete my joy by being of the same mind, having the same love, being in full accord and of one mind. Now, before I move on, this does not mean we give up our individuality. Okay? Um, God made you unique. He made me unique, and I thank God there are no other unique me's like me. Um, but there is, as, as Paul writes elsewhere in, in Ephesians, there is one church, there is one God, there is one uh, Father of us all. Now, we have different functions in how we are to minister, um, but there really is one goal and what's going on in all of this book, and that's the redemption of man, okay? So he's not telling you that you have to be like me or you have to be like Paul. He's actually calling you to be like Jesus. So picking up in verse 3, 
do nothing from selfish ambition or conceit, but in humility count others more significant than yourselves. You want to deal with pride, this is how you deal with pride. Okay? Uh, verse 4, let each of you look not only to his own interests, but also to the interests of others. <clears throat> now here's where we come to the core of what I believe is the central point of this entire book, this letter. Have this mind among yourselves, which is yours in Christ Jesus. So if you are in Christ Jesus, if you are part of the body of Christ Jesus, then this is the mindset that you should have. This is yours in Christ Jesus, who, though he was in the form of God, did not count equality with God a thing to be grasped, but emptied himself by taking the form of a servant, being born in the likeness of men, and being found in human form, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. Therefore God has highly exalted him and bestowed on him the name that is above every name, so that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. All right, so um, I, I believe that, that Paul is summarizing the gospel here. But he's doing it not to unbelievers. He's doing it to believers because this is the example that we are called to follow. And if you remember, at the Last Supper, Jesus demonstrated how he wanted the disciples to be, how he expected leadership to be, and that was by being a servant. Okay? Now, if we look at this passage, we see a, a, an incredible incredible thing. Now, in our Western mindset, we miss a lot of things that are going on here. There's just a couple points I want to make, and then I'm going to go back and tie other passages to this. Um, first, we've got to be selfless. Okay? It, it reads that way back up in verse 4. Uh, verse 3 uh, we consider others better than ourselves. That doesn't mean that they're better at particular things, but that our mindset should be that we are in a position of servanthood to them. And that, that word we talked about last week, uh, a couple weeks ago as well, is doulos. That's a slave or a bond servant. Okay? And, and it's interesting here because down in verse 7, when it says that Jesus emptied himself by taking the form of a servant, that's doulos. He became a slave. He became a bond servant. Okay? Um, and if it's good enough for him, it should be good enough for us. So, having this mind, which is in Christ Jesus, he was God. Now, it was really interesting. I read a note um, this week as I was going back over and uh, I, I thought the author made a very good point. What Paul is doing right here, if we hold this up into contrast with creation, we see that Jesus being the second Adam actually succeeded where the first Adam failed. Okay? And, and what we see is Jesus, who is God, removing himself from that position of authority, giving up the place of God to become a man. But then we look back in Genesis chapter 3, and we see one who was created a man who is trying to elevate himself above his position to be equal to God. And that's where sin comes in. All right? So we see this thing that, that what Adam did incorrectly... Christ does properly because he is God and yet he gave up the right of being God, all the privileges, all that was due him and became like us, but not just like us. He became like the lowest of us 
And not just like the lowest of us, but suffered scorn and shame and false accusation and ridicule and ultimately death. And not just death, but death on a cross. And if you studied anything in the Old Testament, you understand what a curse that is. Okay? Scripture tells us that cursed is anyone who hangs on a tree. So he even humbled himself, not just to death, but by, by the most ignominious death, by the most uh, shameful death. And he's doing God's will. Where Adam took it upon himself to do his will, Christ took it upon himself to do the Father's will. But it doesn't end there. Okay? So death on the cross, but we know that Jesus was resurrected, and we know that God uh, exalts him because in the economy of God, how do you get exalted? By being humble. You don't go to God with your list of accomplishments and, and think to impress him. Hey, God, look what I did. Did you see that? That guy cut me off and I didn't even get mad. <laughs> If we truly understood the nature of our God and we truly understood our nature, our place, our position relative to his place and his position, there's not a one of us that could have any amount of pride. Okay. I mean, you look at the prophets. Woe to me, for I am undone. Okay. So, we should start at a position of humility, of humbleness. Okay. But Scripture says that if we humble ourselves in God's sight, He will lift us up. But what's the difference? The difference is that He's the one giving honor instead of you being the one trying to get honor. Okay. So, He raises Jesus up and he exalts him because Jesus humbled himself and he bestowed on him a name that is above every name. There's, there's no name above the name of Jesus Christ. And, and uh, you know, we're, we're going to be shocked when we get up there and people are calling him Yeshua. Um, because that's just what, wait, wait, what? Uh, by the way, does anybody, can anybody uh, real quick turn in your Bible to the book of Yaakov? <laughs> the book of Yaakov. Thank you. James. Yeah, just, just a little tidbit for you to file away for, you know, if you ever get on a tidbit show. Um, James, the Lord's brother, uh, he was actually Jacob, Yaakov, and when they translated his name, now, I, quite honestly, I believe that... Uh, they did it with intent to, to butter up King James, um, who, who was not a righteous man by any means. Uh, I believe that when they first translated the book into English, they changed the name of Yaakov. They didn't transliterate it into Jacob like we would expect. They changed it to James, uh, and I think that was because they wanted King James uh, underwriting their venture. Uh, some people say, well, actually, if you look at how it's translated from this language to this language and this language to this language, you can see how it would get from here to here. Uh, that might be the case, but it certainly didn't hurt that they put the name of the king who they wanted to underwrite their project in the book. Okay, so, but Jesus' name is going to be above every name. And at his name, look at, look at, the, 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 quotes, the quotas that he's given here. If you look at the quotas he's given, he, say, he says, uh, it is above every name. That means there's not one equal to or above. All of the other names are below him. Okay? And at his name, every knee will bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth. Uh, by the way, under the earth, I think that's just... Uh, um, Sheol. I, I think that's the grave. I think that's those who are waiting judgment before being cast into the fire. Um, so basically what he's saying is if there is someone somewhere 
they're going to bow. They're going to bend their knee. Okay? And every tongue, again, look at the word, every, that means all of them, confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. Now, just real quick, one of the things that I've, I've really come across quite a bit uh, in the church, it's probably universal, but, but I've noticed it specifically in the United States. Um, we are very willing, or most of us are very willing, to have Jesus as our Savior. Uh, we want the, the grace that comes, we don't want to go to hell. Okay, uh, I don't even remember back in the 70s. There was a might have actually been in the 60s. There was a, a rock star uh, who said that he didn't want to go to heaven. He wanted to go to hell where he could party with all his friends. There's not going to be a party in hell. Okay, what what there's going to be in hell, which by the way was not created for mankind. It was created for the devil and, and his minions, but what will be in hell is weeping and gnashing of teeth. Uh, so, uh, anyway, back to this. Uh, Jesus Christ is Lord. We, we don't want him as Lord. We want him as potentially a counselor. Uh, sometimes a target but we don't want him as boss. We don't like it when people tell us what to do. Okay? I really don't like it when people tell me what to do. Ask me. I will bend over backwards to help you. Don't tell me. That's my pride. Okay? That's not a good thing. That's a bad thing. That's something that God is working out of me. He's been at it for 51 years. Okay? Yeah, 51 years. So, every tongue is going to confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. Some of us will be doing it willingly because we've already accepted that he is Lord. Some are going to be doing it against their will. But they have to acknowledge who he is. They will bow. We will bow, all of us. And we all will confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. Now, I don't want to go too far into this. We're actually going to tear this passage apart and really look in depth at what's going on here. But this is a very few verse summation of the entire gospel. Okay? The, the life and ministry of Jesus Christ here on the earth. This is the, the, what I believe is the heart of the message in the book of Philippians. And I, I think this is all based on the idea that Paul is calling us to be like Christ. And as we back up and we start looking at these different sections, what's going on here, we're going to see how all of these things kind of fit together around this central idea that Jesus Christ is our example. Okay? So, let's back up just a little bit. Uh, go back over to chapter 1. I'm just going to very briefly summarize these, these different sections. Um, these are the ones that I've given it. Your, your Bible may have different headings, and that's okay. Uh, we see at the very start that uh, Paul opens his letter with gratitude. Uh, he is immediately acknowledging the purpose of his writing this letter is to say thank you. And so we, we see starting in verse 1, he gives his introduction. He, you know, we, we sign our name at the end of the book. They sign their name at the beginning of the book. Um, it's just a, a, a greeting. It's the format that they used. Uh, it's significant in that um, it's, it's a unique signature of Paul. We'll talk about that a little bit later. But that we see this, uh, this uh, thanksgiving and, and encouragement that if you read down through verse 11, you're going to see that this passage is talking about the, the transformation that Christ begins in us at salvation, but then works out in us through maturity and sanctification. This is how Paul is starting off his letter. Hey, thank you. This is great, but there's also more to this. And, and where we start, we don't end where we start. Okay? Because if you, you 
are at the same place you started the race, at the end of the race, you didn't move. Unless you're on a circle track or an oval, and, and that just that just throws my whole illustration out. So you're on a straight track. <laughs> All right? You got to be further along than where you started. Now some people are gonna do sprints and then get gassed and they're gonna have to stop for a while and catch their breath. Other people are gonna pace themselves. Uh, you can think of the, the uh, turtle and the hare. The, the end result being that we are all pushing toward the goal and that we are all pushing toward Christ and that we all want to run as though to win the race. All right? Because this race is not me against you. It's me against me. Okay? So, he uh, acknowledges his imprisonment. We know that he was in prison at the time. Uh, it, it kind of uniquely that uh, Paul, Paul kind of takes this passage and he kind of flips it over because when we hear that somebody's in jail, specifically somebody is in prison because of the gospel of Jesus Christ, we think, oh no, but Paul says, oh yes, because he's not the one that's bound. <laughs> they are. And can you imagine having to sit every day under the teaching of Paul? <laughs> every day. Okay, so in this first section up through verse 11, he, he is uh, talking about uh, the completion, running this race to completion, that, that God who began, that Jesus who began a work in us, will complete it. That is something that should give us confidence, especially on days when we feel like we're just not making any progress. So going on to our next section, uh, verses 12 through 26, um, he addresses kind of the whole purpose of, of this letter. He, he knows by Epaphroditus that they're bringing him stuff to, to minister to his need, that they are concerned for him that they, they have a deep-hearted concern for what's going on with Paul. Remember, he was the one that established the church at Philippi, he and Silas, and, and built up the church there. And so, uh, in, in a lot of ways, they're looking to him kind of as the church father. No, not to diminish Christ or our Heavenly Father, but he's the, the means whereby God established the church at Philippi. So, in this next passage, um, he wants them to be inspired, uh, to be open about their faith. Uh, as a matter of fact, the people that are with Paul in his imprisonment, we know at least that Epaphroditus is there. We know that Timothy is there. Uh, depending on where, which imprisonment this was, there were other people that were there with him. Um, but in this kind of weird twisted fate, not only is Paul using his imprisonment as an opportunity to minister, but those that are around him are taking courage from his example, and they are being faithful witnesses as well. And, and so Paul is saying, hey, look, this thing, it may look like a bad thing for us because, you know, I'm in chains, and, and I'm basically, if, if this is where I think it was, he was on house arrest, uh, which was a whole lot better than being in a Roman prison. Uh, he, he had a little bit more freedom there, and he could be supplied by other people to come in and take care of his needs. As a matter of fact, if it really is what I think it is, uh, he was responsible for his own needs. They didn't give him anything other than the chains. So he, he, he turning this thing upside down, he says, we're looking at it wrong, um, just like a lot of things looking through the knot hole of the cross. Um, we look at it on this side and go, oh no. And then we look at it through the cross, and we go, oh yes. So he's, he's addressing this issue. Um, he's talking about uh, the, the differences and in, in the attitudes of people that are preaching Christ. But what, what he really wants to focus on is that Christ is being preached. Um, we'll get into this a little bit more. That's, that kind of wraps up that second section. Uh, this next passage, starting in uh, chapter 2, verse 6, uh, that's part of the passage that we just read. Um, like I said, I believe this is the heart of what Paul is, is wanting to get across. Um, we've already addressed the, the, the heart of the passage, but I, I thought it was really interesting as I read through this. Not only does 
does Paul uh, compare Christ uh, by extension to Adam being the exact opposite of what Adam was and what Adam did, um, he also predicts Christ as the fulfillment of the passages in Isaiah, the book of Isaiah, uh, specifically the suffering servant passages, which are uh, considered to be from chapter 40 to chapter 55. And what's really cool about this is that he wraps up the heart of this message by calling Christ God. Okay? We don't really understand things the way that they do because we don't use the same terminology. But first, if you called yourself the son of someone, you were equal to that person. Okay, you carried the authority of that person. That's why when Jesus declared himself to be the son of God, the religious Jews picked up rocks to throw at him because they, they were saying he has made himself equal with God. What did he say? He said he was the son of God. That as the Son of God, he is equal to God. Now, Paul is making this self-same statement here by saying that Jesus Christ is Lord. But he does this uh, specifically, uh, if you have your Bible, turn real quick over to Isaiah 50, or, sorry, 45. Uh, I just want to read this one verse for you. Okay, so this is a prophecy uh, that Isaiah gave. Uh, it's actually the, the prophecy about Cyrus uh, coming and, and delivering Israel out of their captivity so that they can go back to the land. But look down here in verse 23. Uh, this is the Lord speaking through Isaiah. By myself I have sworn. Uh, Hebrews actually addresses this. There's When you swear by somebody, you swear by somebody that's greater than you. Okay? That gives you their authority. Um, but, because there is no one greater than God, he swears by himself. Okay? Uh, From my mouth has gone out in righteousness a word that shall not return. To me, every knee shall bow, every tongue shall swear allegiance. Okay? Uh, Paul is using this passage to illustrate that Jesus Christ is God. Okay? This is one of the passages that we can look back on when we're talking about uh, the triune nature of God in that he is one, but he is coexistent and co-equal in three parts. God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. Okay, and, and honestly, um, we can't wrap our brains around it. If somebody tells you they've got it figured out, they've misunderstood the equation. <laughs> okay, um, yes ma'am? Uh, chapter 45, verse 23. Yep. So, Paul, using the passage from, uh, actually referring back to the passage in the book of Isaiah, specifically that verse, is declaring that Jesus Christ is God. Now, we accept that because we've been raised in a culture where that is so. But who is Paul writing to in Philippians? Besides the church. What was the church comprised of? Romans. Gentiles. Romans. Remember that uh, Philippi was made a colony of Rome, which gave them more privileges than just territories that they had conquered. Uh, the bulk of what populated Philippi was actually soldiers uh, from the battle with uh, uh, Octavian, <coughs> Mark Anthony. Um, they retired a bunch of those soldiers to that and made that a colony. Uh, as such, there was a huge amount of national pride. Hey. We're better than you because we're citizens of Rome. You're just not citizens of Rome, okay? As such, you had uh, rights that other people did not have. 
One of which was, we know because of Paul, is you could appeal to Caesar. Okay? Every Roman citizen had the right to appeal to Caesar. So, um, having this mentality, being such a patriotic city, uh, they would most likely have been very fixed on uh, their pantheon of gods, okay? And in, included to the pantheon of gods that they, they would uh, worship, Jupiter and Mars and, and all of those. They also had uh, the deification of Caesar. And so uh, probably what Paul was contending with here in Philippi was not so much the, the problem that he had with the Jews that Jesus couldn't be God because God is God and God is one and Jesus plus God would be two and that can't work. Uh, rather, he's having a little bit of a different uh, struggle here. His struggle here is to get their mind beyond their pantheon and, and their Caesar to the idea that there is one who is over all. Okay, and when the believers uh, were sharing the gospel, they had to approach that same issue with the people in Philippi. Um, being that they were a thriving church, we know that they were a testifying church. We know that they were a witnessing church. So that's kind of the, the thing that they're having to deal with there. And uh, we, we kind of deal with the same thing here in the United States because there's a lot of people here and even in the church that have deified being an American. Um, being an American is great, absolutely great. We have got so many privileges. We have got so much freedom that we don't even know how much we've got, okay? Uh, we just take things for granted. The fact that we're sitting here openly, reading the word, that we can gather in groups of more than two or three. Wow, the fact that, uh, just, just out of curiosity, uh, how many of you have more than one car in your household? Yeah. Yeah, buddy. Now, of those cars, how many are actually running? If they don't run, they don't count. All right? We are blessed. We are beyond blessed with things. With things. I'll tell you what. If some hostile nation wanted to throw down America, they would destroy the internet. People would not be able to function without their phones, their tablets, their laptops, their TVs, their whatever it all is. It would completely turn this world on its ear. Okay? But in America, one of the things that we have to contend with, with the gospel of Christ, is, is the um, independent spirit, the independent nature of who we are. Uh, we have grown up in a country where we don't have classes. Uh, we don't have ranks of people. We don't have nobles. We don't have kings and queens. We have a head of our country for four years, possibly eight, and then we move on to the next one. Okay? We don't get the idea of lordship. We, we really don't. And that's why I think it's hard for a lot of Americans to humble themselves. Thank you. Um, and go under the yoke of Christ. We of all people are proud. Oh, we are so proud. I remember years ago when I actually watched the Olympics, um, so this would have been back in the 90s. I was watching, um, it was the, the Summer Olympics, and I was watching uh, track and field. And it jumped out at me so powerfully. It is no wonder that most of the world thinks we're arrogant. Um, as I watched the men line up to run, and I don't even know what they were running. Um, I don't know if it was a sprint or, or long distance, I, I don't know. 
But I noticed that as you looked through the different lanes of the tracks, you got to, you, you could tell immediately which ones were Americans, not by the, the uniform, the track uh, outfit that they wore, but by how much gold they were wearing. Mm -hmm. uh, I'm not kidding, They're necklaces, earrings, uh, uh, I was amazed. You, you look at these other countries that are represented there, there was no bling. Only the Americans. Now, I don't know what they're like today. Maybe there are people that, uh, of other countries that are doing that now, I don't know. But it just, it, it, I could see, for the first time in my life, I could see why other nations have issue with us. <coughs> because we think we're all that. Okay? Um, now, just remember one thing that should keep you humble in all of this. Everything that you have been given, you will give an accounting for. Okay? You will stand before God at one point, uh, one day, and you will give an account for what you did with the things that he gave you. Now, again, this is not a judgment about salvation. Don't worry about that. Uh, if you are in Christ, your name is in the Lamb's Book of Life, you will not be judged according to uh, whether or not you will be saved, but you will be judged according to the rewards that you are going to, be, to receive. Uh, so going back to this, uh, moving after the heart, he... He transitions into giving two examples of, of men that are living the example of Jesus Christ, that they're pressing in hard after Jesus Christ. The first one is Timothy. Uh, we see this starting in verse 19 of chapter 2 uh, and through verse 24. And he talks about how uh, Timothy is a son. But one of the things that I think is really cool here, he says... Uh, for I have no one, this is verse 20, for I have no one like him who will be genuinely concerned for your welfare. For they all seek their own interests, not those of Jesus Christ. And this, I believe, verse 21 is a reference back to those who are preaching out of selfish gain. Um, because Paul does that. He will start talking about something and then he inserts a three-page parenthetical statement. And then he comes back to what he started three pages ago. Um, but you know Timothy's proven worth, how as a son with a father, he has served with me in the gospel. And so Paul wants to send him to them on his behalf. And, and he's using Timothy as an example of one that serves. And then he goes right into uh, more personal, whereas Paul is going to send Timothy to the church at Philippi, he is sending back Epaphroditus. Now Epaphroditus was the one that was entrusted with the gift to bring it to Paul. And he was serving on behalf of the church. He was serving on behalf of Paul. And it almost cost him his life. Okay. Uh, we see here down in verse 27. Uh, Indeed he was Ill, Ill, near to death. But God had mercy on him. And not only on him, but on me also. Lest I should have sorrow upon sorrow. Um, so Epaphroditus comes, he presents this gift to Paul. We don't know what all was in the gift. We know that there were probably food items, things that would, be, uh, would, would help take care of his daily needs. But then Epaphroditus gets sick, and, and not just a little sick. Okay? Um, he got sick to the point that they were concerned that he was going to die. And this as a result of him serving. Okay? So... But, I, I love the way that Paul says this, um, God had mercy not just on Epaphroditus, but also on Paul, because Paul, Paul couldn't, he, he couldn't handle the, the sorrow upon sorrow. Okay? And so God blessed Epaphroditus, and by extension, blessed Paul. Um, so he, he sends in this letter that he's sending them back, which they will know because Epaphroditus is probably going to carry the letter, and they're going to be like, Epaphroditus, who? Whoa, where did you come from? No, they're going to understand that, but he's putting in this, this example of his of service, and, and he's sending him back with joy. And uh, so he, he lists these two men as examples of men that are following Christ and trying to follow the example of Christ. Well, then we get down into uh, chapter 3. And in chapter 3... Paul uses himself as an example. And remember, uh, sometime back when we first started the introduction, one of the topics that Paul is going to address, and he addresses in actually a number of his epistles, are the Judaizers. Okay? 
Um, just, just briefly, Judaizers are those of the Jewish faith that accepted Jesus Christ, but they, in accepting Jesus Christ, they tried to blend him in to the Mosaic law and the traditions of their fathers. And so instead of uh, Christ coming to save all mankind from their sin, because of God's grace and because of faith that God gives us, that leads us to salvation, that gives us salvation, they wanted to blend these things together, and one of the most important things for them was snippy snippy. Okay? They wanted all of the men to be circumcised. This became such an area of contention uh, that uh, if you remember Paul's first missionary journey, um, they would actually chase him from town to town. They would make things hot for him in a town, and so he would leave. He and Barnabas would leave. They'd go to another town, and after a few days, guess who would show up? Show up, uh, the Judaizers from previous towns, and they're coming to. And they chased him the entirety of his ministry. He dealt with the Judaizers. Uh, this is why Paul writes in the Book of Romans how we are saved. He writes in Ephesians how we are saved. He writes in Corinthians how we are saved. And and it's never by works, never. Because none of us can do anything to impress God. Because we can't take away our sin. Okay? So no matter how many good things a person does, sin will keep you eternally separated from God. That's the whole point of the cross. Okay, so Paul goes through, he deals with the Judaizers, he gives his qualifications according to his Jewishness. Um, uh, look down there in verse 4, he says, Though I myself has re have reason for confidence in the flesh also, if anyone thinks he has reason for confidence in the flesh, I have more. Circumcised on the eighth day of the people of Israel, of the tribe of of Jew, uh, Benjamin, a Hebrew of Hebrews, as to the law of Pharisee, as to zeal, a persecutor of the church, as to righteousness under the law, blameless. <laughs> that is a bold statement. But then look at what he says in verse 7. But whatever gain I had, I counted as loss for the sake of Christ. Indeed, I count everything as loss because of the surpassing worth of knowing Christ Jesus my Lord. Now, again, this is a, one of those things that translation does not carry very well. Uh, in verse 7, when Paul says, um, I count everything as loss, the word that he uses there is zamia, which means loss. You've, just, you've lost something. Okay? But it, when you go into verse 8, does anybody have a different reading in verse 8, uh, specifically where it says, I count everything as loss? Rubbish. Rubbish. Um, you know, we, we tend to be very um, politically correct in English. Uh, we, we tend to kind of soften things that really shouldn't be softened because the word used in verse 8 for rubbish or for loss, uh, that's actually scubalon, which means poop. Okay? Um, yeah, except that it, it's, it's not quite as nice as that. Uh, this, this would actually be a word that you could use as a curse word. Okay? That's what Paul considers everything that he had prior to Christ. It's, 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 it's got to it's gotta get flushed. It's got to go. Okay? Now, we tend to be delicate in church. And I think sometimes we tend to be so delicate that we miss the severity. We miss the seriousness of what's really going on. Um, you know, Jesus said that uh, if you love your father or mother, brother or sister, son or daughter more than me, you are not worthy of me. A lot of times we like to, to make light of that passage, but if uh, Christ is not the center of your life, if Christ is not on the throne of your life, things are not going to work well for you. Okay? 
because the kingdom isn't just what comes when he comes back. The kingdom is being built right now. Okay? Doors are open for citizens. People want to become citizens. Doors are open. Come in. Get your card stamped. Declare yourself for him. Be his. Because one day those doors will shut and nobody else will be allowed. Okay? So, in, in this passage, Paul lists all of his uh, credentials and then turns around and says they are worth nothing. They are worth dung. Uh, so, he moves on um, talking about the race, running the race. Uh, everything that he has is not his. Uh, what he does have was given him. And so he comes up to chapter 4. And in chapter 4, um, Paul actually gives us an example of, of how we are to live out this example of Christ in our life. Okay? And this, this last passage, uh, chapter 4, he actually has just a couple of things that he wants to tie in here. Uh, for whatever reason, I don't know what was going on. I bet you you don't know what was going on. But two of the women at the church at Philippi were at odds. There was strife. Uh, Paul doesn't go into what caused the strife. We don't need to know what the cause was. We just need to know that there was an issue between Euodia and Syntyche. And, and Paul is calling to them and reminding them that there is unity in the body of Christ. In the body of Christ, we don't have time to deal with hurt feelings. Okay? Now that doesn't mean you get to ride roughshod over everybody. Remember, we go back to the passage, consider other people better than yourself. Consider yourself a servant to, to them. All right? That's the example that is modeled for us. But whatever's going on here between these two women, he, he says, I entreat you, I, I ask you please to agree in the Lord. Um, <clears throat> And then he talks to the people that are there, and he says, help these women. Help them get along. Help them work it out. I'm not good as a mediator. I'm not. Because to me, every problem has an easy solution. Get away from each other. Shut up. <laughs> I love the way that men, that dads and moms deal with their kids. Okay? And I got to see that um, quite a bit uh, over the last few days. Uh, because moms, two of the kids will have an issue. And two of the kids will come to mom. Usually it's one kid that feels slighted first, and then the second child will, will make an appearance because they want to defend themselves and tell their side of it. Uh, but that is actually a proverb. Uh, you know, uh, the first witness sounds credible until the second witness cross-examines him. Um, but they both talk at the same time. <laughs> and mom listens to what's going on and then uh, ministers uh, correction as needed. And things go chirping along. Dads don't do that. Okay? I don't do that. I don't deal well with more than one person talking. Okay? So when they come up and they want to share their story and their side of things, the first thing I've got to do is get one of them to be quiet so I can hear the other story. And then turn about being fair play. Now it's your turn to be quiet and what is your problem? Your, what's your side of the story? I dispense justice equally. You're both in trouble because you have troubled me. <laughs> okay? I have found over the last couple of weeks, um, since Benj and Shay have been at the house, uh, for the first little while they would come to me with their issues. They no longer do so. <laughs> I am so grateful for that. <laughs> and one of my new favorite sayings is, you have to ask your mom or dad. Yeah. Papa, I know what you're going to say. Got to talk to mom and dad. Well, they're not here. You're going to have to wait till they get 
I love being a grandpa. <laughs> All right, so moving on real quick. Whatever this contest was between them, whatever this struggle was, Paul tells them, you've got to work it out. Uh, he then goes into a passage that I think every one of us should have as, as like the root of how we deal with life. We're going to go into this in, in great depth. This is one of my favorite passages in all of Scripture. It talks about how to deal with anxiety, how to deal with trouble. Um, Paul is giving us practical tips for living out the example of Christ in our lives. And then he wraps up uh, this last part by, you, you know, they, they tell you when uh, you're writing an essay that you do in your introduction, you tell them what you're going to tell them. And then you tell them. And then at the conclusion, you tell them what you told them. Okay, and that's exactly what Paul's doing. He starts off by saying thank you. He goes through all of these different things that are in some way connected to living out the example of Christ. And then he wraps up again with, with thanksgiving. And, and then he goes even further, and, and he has learned something that I think we all need to learn. I've learned the secret of being content. Whether having much or whether having little, because there's just as much difficulty in being content when you have much. Because you never have enough. And you'd be amazed. I've, I've read some of the biographies of some of the, the wealthiest men in America um, they were miserable. They were miserable. The money gave them nothing but heartache and headache. Okay? So, having too little is a problem, having too much is a problem, but if you are content with whatever God gives you, those no longer are a problem. Alright? So, um, he, again, he thanks them. Um, he's, he's not... Uh, he wants them to be credited with the work that they have done on his behalf. Um, he sends Epaphroditus back, and then in verse 21, he wraps this whole thing up with what we would say, uh, you know, sincerely, or love, or uh, I don't know what else people write at the end of their notes. Uh, but he says, greet every saint in Christ Jesus. Uh, I think that's a little bit particular issue that we're going to talk about later because it's not just those who are at Philippi. Uh, and then he passes on the greeting of those that are there. So there's your outline. Um, if you have any questions about that, come talk to me after. Um, I can kind of help you out a little bit more. But that's how I'm, I'm breaking apart the book of Philippians. That's what I see is going on in the book of Philippians. If you see something different, that's okay. Because we've got a God that is far bigger than I am. Okay? So, um, 